Okay, can you hear me in the back? All right, cool. Okay, so uh, thanks for sticking around until the end of the session, end of the uh, conference, I should say. Is everybody having a good time? Yeah. All right, good. Are, are you ready for the raffle after this? I heard there's some really good prizes, so. All right, so uh, this presentation is called Future Proof Your Web Apps with Web Components and Lit, H Lit Element, excuse me. Uh, so, um, what uh, I'm going to be talking about today are those two things, web components and lit element. First, I'll just talk about myself for a minute. Um, and I just realized I forgot my clicker, so uh, hold on a second here. No, actually, let's forget it. Okay, <laughs> so uh, my name is Keto. And uh, I am the principal consultant at my own little company called uh, Virtua. And uh, there we do training, consulting, and uh, mentoring uh, for uh, a variety of technologies. So a lot of uh, Java backend development um, and front end development using um, different technologies like web components and uh, Polymer uh, and uh, Angular as well. And let me give it to you. I decided at the last minute to switch to uh, Firefox, so uh, I, may, I may be having a little bit of a <laughs> difficulty here. Um, all right, um, and in addition to uh, doing consulting and training, mentoring, et cetera, I'm a Java champion. Anyone here work with Java before? Any Java people? All right, so there's a few, a few of you, cool. Um, so Java champions are just people that have uh, done a lot of uh, stuff in the Java industry over the years. Um, I'm also a Google developer expert in web technologies, uh, mainly for working with Polymer web components, those sorts of things. Um, I, I uh, host a newscast, a podcast. Anyone in here uh, listen to podcasts? All right, cool. So for, for the five of you that raise your hands, um, you should check out my podcast. It's called Enterprise Java News, but we're changing the name to Stacked because we, we cover front end and back end. It's not just Java. So, um, and I also speak at lots of conferences. So uh, that's my story. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit about you guys, though. So, uh, how many of you consider yourselves JavaScript experts? First question. Oh, come on. All right, so uh, only a few of you. Um, how many of you uh, currently work with Angular? I'm surprised you're not in the other the Angular talk, but okay. Um, how many of you currently work with uh, React? There's the rest of the room, okay. And how many of you currently work with uh, web components? All right, hope, uh, hopefully this will be, still be interesting. Uh, how many of you uh, don't work with any framework or web components? jQuery, woohoo! <laughs> okay, all right, cool. How many of you work with Vue? All right, so we've got a few of you here, cool. All right, good to know. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna start with a very quick sort of um, overview of web components. I'm not gonna go too deep into this because I wanna spend more time on lit element and show code, but um, to start with, um, the, the key thing about web components is that they're actually a browser standard, so the same way like any API you use inside of the browser is a standard that's always available in the browser, web components are always available in the browser, okay? And what's great about that is that now we actually have a native component model um, built into the browser, whereas before, um, there was no native component model, so every framework had to invent their own component model, okay? Um, so there was actually one built into the browser, and it does this basically uh, by using several different specifications. And basically, the way the browser specs work is, you know, several different ones usually are created that work in tandem with each other. Um, so you sort of carve out uh, a feature into, into bite-sizable chunks uh, specifically. So uh, the first one is custom elements. And custom elements lets you write uh, in JavaScript um, an element that looks just like any other element in the browser, okay? So that's like the number one piece, and that's arguably the most important piece of, of web components, is that you can actually write something which looks like a real regular element, like an input or a div or a span or um, 
many other uh, elements, okay? Even like a video element. Um, template element is another one. And this basically lets you have a chunk of HTML which you can sort of create and then store to use later, okay? And basically it gets parsed and created, but it doesn't actually get executed in the browser. So you can have it and then reuse it later. You can create copies of it. Um, you can have different classes that use it, et cetera. So think of it as just a way to um, work with uh, chunks of HTML, okay? Another one is Shadow DOM. And Shadow DOM is essentially the ability to have a, um, the internals of your component essentially be hidden from the rest of the page. So the number one benefit of that is, is essentially scoping of styles. So styles in the rest of the page don't necessarily leak down into your component, and styles in your component will not leak to other components on the page, okay? So style encapsulation would be the main feature. Another feature also is just basically the ability to hide your internals, right? So if your component has, you know, 30 different elements inside of it, it's not necessarily something that the user or the component needs to know, okay? Um, another one which um, has sort of died is HTML, uh, I'm sorry, that, that's actually a, a uh, sort of a typo. It's, it's actually HTML imports is what it's supposed to say. Uh, so HTML imports is the last one. Um, and HTML imports was pretty cool because it was essentially the ability to import uh, an HTML file, not a J JS file, um, and basically have the browser grab other imports from inside of it. Um, so you basically, it was another way to handle dependency management, okay? But the nice thing was that by doing that, you could essentially have that HTML file have references to other resources and also have JavaScript inside of it, okay? Um, but uh, mostly Mozilla didn't like that because essentially it kind of meant we had two ways to handle dependencies. One was ES6 modules in the browser and the other would be the HTML import variation. So that one kind of died. There's a few other latest specs which you'll see if you start going down this path. Um, one is CSS custom properties. This is the ability to have, um, a, have a, a web component expose a variable essentially that can be used for styling. So you can say, okay, for a component X, I want to give it uh, the main header font size of you know, 24 pixels or 24 points or whatever. Um, so any component can expose variables that can be used for styling, okay? Um, CSS shadow parts is another one um, which uh, basically allows you to say, for any given component, I want to be able to expose part of my shadow DOM for someone to do any external styling they want on it, okay? And the main benefit of that is that it helps with theming. So if you have themes that you want to apply to lots of different components, they can all expose parts that those styles can then be applied to, okay? Um, and CSS custom properties is in all the, all the browsers. Um, the other three specs are pretty much in all the browsers. Um, with the notable exception of Shadow DOM, which is not in Edge, but will, of course, be in Edge Chromium when that comes out, because that's based on Chromium, which is used by Chrome, which supports everything. So um, CSS custom properties is in all the browsers. CSS shadow parts is currently, it's like a, they're still working on it. It's right now in Firefox and in uh, Chrome. Uh, there's a couple other ones which are on the horizon, constructible style sheets, um, which basically allow you to create style sheets programmatically, okay? Which opens the door for some pretty cool sort of theming use cases. Um, and uh, styles being used across different components. Um, HTML modules is basically a redo of HTML imports, but you, on top of ES6 modules. So it's basically the, the idea of doing the same thing, but using the existing dependency uh, management uh, that's built into ES6 modules, okay? So those are all the specs. Um, so browser support, as I said, is pretty good. Um, Framework support uh, is pretty good. Um, there's actually this great site uh, called Custom Elements Everywhere. So if you're ever curious, you can look and see, okay, how, do my, how does my framework work with web components? And the benefit here is that you know, your, your application, even if you're using another framework, can actually use web components. And in some cases, you can expose parts of your application as web components, which means they can be used in other frameworks, okay? So Angular, of course, does great, because um, Angular is by Google, and Google loves web components, so um, not surprised there. Um, even AngularJS, 
uh, Dojo. <laughs> uh, everything else, everything is doing pretty good except for React. Ah, React. React in its lovely virtual DOM. Um, so, uh, so React, eh, not so great, although it is possible to expose, to consume a web component in React and expose a React component as a web component. It just is not as nice as it could be. Um, and they are still doing some work on that. Um, but pretty much everything else looks pretty good. And I, I don't see, after, since there was an Ember talk in here, I just thought I'd look for Ember. I don't see it on here. So uh, you guys need to you know, contact them and get, get it out there. Uh, so anyways, if you want to see if you, who supports it, you should take a look there. All right, so um, I just want to show a very quick sort of vanilla web component example. Um, so you can just see what they look like. All right. So you, can you guys see this in the back? And, uh, all right. Okay, so this is a very simple web component. Um, this is just ordinary ES6. There's nothing special about this. Um, so really other than extending HTML element, um, the only real other things going on here is there are some specific callbacks. You can get notified when your component is attached to the DOM, when it's detached from the DOM, uh, when uh, it's adopted by another document, um, and also when an attribute changes, you can get notified of that as well so you can do some work, okay? Um, and this here lets uh, the uh, browser know which attributes to tell you about. So, a component, an element has lots of different attributes. You may, not, you may not want to be notified about every single one of them. So this let you, lets you decide which ones you care about, okay? Um, and then we have to do this little part down here, custom elements dot define. This basically tells the browser, okay, use this tag and with my component, okay? And the dash is there, the, basically you have to have at least one dash or else it won't work. So, so you can't have, so you can't like, uh, you know, have an input component. It has to be like my input or something. So this is a sort of a plain vanilla web component, nothing too special going on there. Um, so quickly, um, let's talk a little bit about lit element. So uh, lit element is from the Polymer team. Has anyone heard about Polymer before? Okay, well, it's a good, good amount. All right, so um, the Polymer team um, was tasked a few years ago with sort of basically uh, looking at all web standards related to web components and things like that, and pushing them and coming up with ways to use them and features that you can use on top of them. So they had this, uh, they called it a library, but it was a library with framework tendencies, I'd say, um, called Polymer. Um, and there were three different versions of it. I worked with uh, the first two. Um, and uh, it did a lot of different things on top of web components. And it had a lot of great features in it. Um, it had a lot of the things that are, it had like, CSS properties, but before they were a standard. Um, it had, uh, also had two-way uh, property binding, which is good and bad, uh, depending on your perspective, and lots of other great features. Um, but basically, I think they sort of took a step back. Um, and I should, I should also mention that uh, not only were the projects I was on doing Polymer, but Polymer is actually used in a lot of Google products as well. So um, the most notable one is YouTube uh, desktop is Polymer. So, um, if you're wondering about a good example of a production web component application, go to YouTube. It's a, it's a good example of one um, with high traffic. Um, it's also built into uh, the Chrome UI, um, the Chrome settings and stuff. If you look in there, it's all web components. Um, and there's several other Google properties and lots of other sites that use them. Um, but anyways, I think they took a step back and they said, all right, well, now that the standards are actually in the browsers and everything, let's, let's see what do we actually need, what's the core? And lit element is basically the core. Um, it's basically sort of the key, key features of Polymer without a lot of the extra stuff. And hence the name lit, you know, sort of a lightweight, uh, uh, lightweight library, okay? So it only has a few features. Um, it basically, it extends HTML elements. It's just a base class that you can subclass, okay? Um, it uses lit HTML for templating. And lit HTML is a companion library which can be used with or without lit elements. So you can use lit, lit uh, HTML for any sort of templating you want, but of course it works well with lit element, okay? Um, and uh, 
The other main feature it has is support for property attribute binding. So one of the things you realize, and you, I'm sure all of you are aware of this, you know, if you look at a regular element, browser element, all the attributes are strings, right? But when you write your code, you don't want to deal with only strings, you normally have properties, right? So, and if you look at the native elements, some, they have some attributes which are also properties and some attributes which are not properties, okay? So basically, what lit element does is it lets you sort of handle that in a much more, which, with a lot less work. So if you use the native um, callbacks for web components, for custom elements, and you want to synchronize your properties, you've got to use the attribute change callback and then look to see what property, what attribute it is, and then map it to your own property. It's a little bit of work. So, so uh, lit element makes that easier for you. Um, it also has uh, some handy uh, TypeScript or Babel decorators. Um, so if you went to the Ember talk or pretty much any modern framework like Angular, you see these all over the place. And also has some additional lifecycle methods around rendering as well. So on top of the few that I showed you before, like connected callback, there's some other ones that lit, lit element provides as well. Okay. All right, so let's look at a couple examples. Um, I will show you a pure uh, JavaScript version of a lit element and then also a uh, TypeScript version. All right, so, so this is a pure JavaScript version. And you notice it looks a little bit different than the pure, uh, pure vanilla JS version of, um, of a, a custom element. So here we extend lit element instead of extending HTML element, right? Um, and then instead of having that uh, static getter that returns the list of um, attributes to watch, we return essentially property descriptors, okay? So here we're basically telling lit element, these are the properties that I want you to care about, okay? And for each of these properties, I'm gonna give you the type, and there's some other things you can provide too, which we'll talk about later, okay? So this is essentially where you, you're basically telling lit element, let me, help me with my property attribute mapping stuff, okay? Um, then of course, there's constructor. Um, here we're just setting up initial values for our properties, okay? And then the render method is actually where the rendering takes place. And you'll notice that we're not using an external file for a template here, okay? So because lit element is designed to not require another build step or any special tools, um, it all is just pure JavaScript. Um, you don't have to use, you don't really have the ability to load an external template, okay? Now it doesn't mean that you, know, you couldn't have another tool which you know, generated, took a file, and then generated code for it and put it in a lit element, that's totally doable. Um, also, that the upcoming um, HTML modules spec would allow you to have external files as well. But right now, the way things work is you use this HTML here, and this is what we call a template uh, tagged literal, okay? Um, so, uh, basically, this is a function, okay? And we're sending it this uh, literal here, and we can put whatever JavaScript expressions we want in it. It's not magic, right? It's like, okay, it's JavaScript. Um, so the drawback, of course, is that you, know, you are sort of putting your HTML in your JavaScript, but the benefit is that you have the ability to uh, really do lots of powerful things, okay? And it gets, it's, not, it's not like JSX, it's actually JavaScript. There's nothing really special going on here, okay? So you see here, we're referencing different properties and displaying values, okay? Okay. All right, so if you want to get started with a lit element project, there's not a whole lot you have to really do. You could really just open up a text editor, create a JS file, and start writing code, right? Um, and actually, I forgot one thing. Um, <laughs> I meant to show the TypeScript example. All right, so the uh, TypeScript example is you notice it's a little bit more uh, a little terse, right? So basically, the, the main benefit here is we uh, use, are we're using decorators, okay? Um, and uh, since we're, we're doing initialization here when we declare the properties, we don't have to have it in the constructor, okay? So with TypeScript, you get uh, the ability to use decorators, and you can use the decorators also 
um, for pure JS elements. It's a little bit different, but it's the same idea. Okay. All right. So, so you don't have to do a whole lot special um, in order to start with lit element. Like I said, you can just fire up a text editor, start writing some JavaScript. Um, there are different ways you can uh, get started, though, if you want to make your life easier. So. Um, there is a lit element starter, which is easy to, easy to find. If you just go to the, if you go to the lit element documentation, there's a little starter you can clone. Um, there's a great site uh, called OpenWC that has a whole bunch of uh, recipes for building web components. They have a starter as well. Um, and if you just do you know lit element starter on GitHub, you'll find 20 different versions to start with Rollup, Webpack, anything else that you want to use. Okay. And you can also roll your own. If there's a particular tool chain that you like, you can just use it that way, okay? Um, one of the things you do need, though, is a development web server, okay? So one of the key things about lit element is that it uses sort of the, the bare node style uh, imports. But if you want to run it directly in the browser, the uh, import, the import syntax is a little bit different, right? It has to be, actually be a relative path and everything. Um, so, uh, the, there's two servers that make this, sort of do this translation for you transparently. Um, and one is the Polymer CLI server, uh, and the other one is Open uh, Web Components ES Dev server. Either one of them sort of do that translation automatically for you. And then whatever build tool you have to use, you just have to ensure it does that as well. Okay. All right, so let's look at a demo. And we got... 24 minutes, all right. So uh, what I did was I just did, I rolled my own. Um, and really, uh, this project is ridiculously simple. So you noticed um, all it has uh, is two dependencies, lit element and the ES dev server, all right? Um, I didn't bother with the build stuff for this demo, so um, that would, of course, be additional dependencies. Um, that's basically all this is, is. It's just lit element and the ES dev server. And, uh, and I decided to use TypeScript because um, I'm a big fan of TypeScript. How many people here use TypeScript out of curiosity? All right, so decent number. Um, but of course, you don't have to use TypeScript. TypeScript you can use pure, uh, pure JavaScript as well. So what we're going to do is create a very simple... Um, little app that talks to GitHub and gets a list of repos, okay? And those repos, you, we want to be able to filter them by uh, topic, okay? So um, I have my ES dev server running here. Um, and uh, if I go to the site, I'll get this. And um, just so you can see what it looks like. This is what our, our uh, application looks like. And I'm not a web designer, so it's not beautiful, but, but it's not really ugly. I've seen worse. Uh, anyways, so uh, we want to be able to look at GitHub repositories, and uh, we want to be able to, to pick the topic. So uh, these are all the, all the GitHub repositories that have the topic of lit element chosen. So now I can see, okay, these are all the different topics, okay? Um, and then, you know, I can click on one. It will take me to that site. Um, and there's, there's no special scrolling. It just loads everything. There's nothing, nothing fancy going on here. No, no lazy loading, anything like that. Um, but then, you know, I can pick some other topics. Um, and this does an and search. So unless you have multiple ones uh, where someone tags something with a couple different things, you're not going to get hits. So you might find someone that did, like, Polymer and web components or something. Um, so, so let's just sort of do a quick search. Okay, that's what we're building. All right, so, so the first thing um, that uh, we can do is uh, basically start with a, a GitHub repository lister. So just like the list of, uh, essentially, the, the list of different uh, repos, okay? Let's not worry about filtering them at first, okay? So what we wanna do is get something like this, okay? So it's just a list of different, uh, different repos, okay? So, uh, you can go here, 
And you can see uh, inside of here, I've got my basic stuff. So I've got a, uh, my GitHub repo list and a GitHub model. Um, so first we'll just look at the HTML file, okay? So here's my component, okay? So essentially this is all just standard stuff, right? I am loading, I'm gonna make it a little bit smaller. I'm loading my script as a module, which is the uh, GitHub repo <laughs> list component, and then I use my component in the page, and then it has a query property, okay? So this query is then being used against the GitHub API to, to get a list of repos back, okay? So that's really all I have to do to use my component. And the component has these two classes. So the first thing it has is this GitHub model, and this is really just a TypeScript thing. TypeScript would be like interfaces, so I'm getting a whole bunch of JSON back from GitHub, and I wanted to be able to reference it in actual structure as opposed to just having to remember what all the properties were, okay? So I went through and I created a couple interfaces, one for the repository results and one for the repository, just so I can have type safe access to the properties. This is not a lit element thing, this is just a TypeScript thing, okay? But the real, the real interesting part is the component itself. All right, so um, I'm using all of the uh, TypeScript or the, the decorators provided, right? So I'd say this is a custom element. And by using this decorator, basically I can avoid this uh, line here. So basically that's all it does is this line here. So I don't have to add that line myself, okay? And then I also return styles. Okay, so this is another uh, template tag literal. Um, and uh, so here uh, I have this function called CSS. This is another thing from lit element. And basically I can put my CSS in here, okay? And in terms of uh, IDE support, there are plugins for VS Code um, and also IntelliJ um, and Atom that are pretty good at using, working with uh, CSS and HTML inside of, of JS or TS files. All right, so um, basically I'm saying, okay, I wanna have a card, okay? And um, this is gonna be applied against anything that is a card, okay? Um, I have a property uh, which uh, is going to be the URL, okay? Um, and then I have uh, the query string as well, okay? And there's a little bit of special stuff here. So this is a simple property, okay? This, in this property I'm basically letting lit handle everything automatically. There's nothing special going on, okay? Um, and you notice this little reflect equals true here? Can anyone guess what that means? Reflect equal true? Anyone? All right, yes. Not exactly. L L yes, it's more of an attribute. So, so essentially uh, what this does is this reflects it in the DOM as an attribute. With the value changes, you can see change in the DOM. Sometimes you want that, sometimes you don't, okay? So lit does not support two-way data binding, it's single way, it's one way down, and if you wanna uh, send information, you just fire an event for something to listen to, okay? Now this property, when someone changes the query, I wanna do some more work. I wanna actually do the query, talk to the server, get the data back, and then update myself, okay? So that's where you have to do a little bit of work. Um, so what you have to do is, you need to call this request update so that lit will update the DOM, Okay, and the only update what has changed is not gonna update everything. And this is not like virtual DOM, this is actually the real DOM. Um, and in order to do this, you have to send the name of the property and the old value. So you have to grab the old value first before you change it, okay. Um, and of course, what we're doing here is we're also performing the query, but this is just normal stuff. In a real application, I might have a service or something, but here I'm just doing fetch and uh, basically getting a JSON response back. Um, and here, I'm requesting an update for the whole DOM. Um, up here, I'm requesting an update just for the query property, okay? So you can decide if you want to update everything or just a single property, okay? So other than that, um, there's not a, not a lot going on here. In the render method, um, I'm basically going to uh, display um, information about that particular repository, right? And all I'm gonna do here is display the name, nothing special. Um, 
And it turns out the way to do this, if you want to iterate through something, you can actually just use normal functions that you normally use on an array, right? So here, um, I have a section with a, with a class of card, right? And basically what I'm doing is I am saying, okay, if there are actually results to display, I'm going to just call a map. And then for each element, I'm basically mapping it to a, another um, literal that has the actual name and HTML in it, okay? So I'm basically just turning the array into a whole bunch of HTML outputs, okay? So that's how I'm displaying all of the, um, all the information here, okay? All right, so that's really all there is going on here. Pretty simple component. Um, and in the page, it looks like this. Okay. So as I said before, it's pretty much the same thing, right? It's just that you have the component and then you're sitting in the query parameter, okay? So the cool thing about web components is that you are working actually in the browser. You don't have like all these layers of indirection between you and the, your app and the rest of the browser, okay? So if I look at this, if I just inspect it, and this works inside of Chrome or Safari or uh, Firefox like I'm using, okay? All right, so here is my component. Can you guys see this in the back? Okay. All right, so here's my component, my Virtua GitHub repo list, right? There's the query, okay? Um, and here's the URL, because remember I said both of those were reflect attributes, so that's why I can see them here, okay? Um, and then there's this shadow root. So remember we talked about the shadow DOM, right? So basically what this is saying is, okay, um, that is now the, uh, that these are the internals of the component, can be open or closed. Open means that you can access it if you want to. Closed means you can't access it at all. Everybody usually uses open. Um, and then inside of it, you can see the contents that I just, uh, that, I'm, that we're rendering, right? So there's wired elements, um, and there's that section, okay? And it's iterating through each element and just displaying the name, okay? So, but what this means though is that you can do cool things like, uh, Okay, and there's my element, okay? So when I say that with custom elements, you actually are, the browser treats it like an element, they really do. So this looks just like any other element, right? And it has a lot of properties. So you actually inherit all the properties from HTML element, okay? But it also means that you can do things which is really handy for testing, et cetera, right? You could do like list.query equals, oh, look, all of a sudden, the values change, right? So I could do list.query and topic react. Now I've got all the react ones. Okay, so basically you can manipulate the element programmatically at runtime, right? It's a pretty cool thing. It lets you really understand the way your code is working and the way your element is interacting with the rest of the application. And this is true not only for top level components but for children as well, okay? Another thing is that you get the sort of the shell encapsulation stuff which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but I will say uh, what's cool is, um, okay, so inside of here, we have a, inside of the shadow root, we have a section element, right? There are no other section elements in the document, okay? So let's see what happens if I just do this. If I just say, you know, okay. Okay, so anyone know what's gonna happen here? Say that again. Okay, so the, the, the guess was it's gonna be an array, not, not quite. Um, so if we look at the section, it's null, right? 
So I did a query for an element, and it's null. And the reason it's null is because it's inside the shadow, uh, shadow root of that particular element. Okay? So that's what we say when we're talking about encapsulation. A, a normal query is not going to find that element. Now, you can do something different. So I still have my list here, right? Okay, so that works, right? So essentially, you get that encapsulation, but it doesn't mean that you can never get to things. It just means that for the, the overall document, the internals of your component are actually hidden, okay? Okay. So, um, looks like I only have eight minutes left. So, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump to the end and sort of show you the, the finished thing and show you the different parts. All right, so um, the final version that we had looked a little bit different, right? It was this one, okay? And there's a few things about this one you'll notice. Um, first, uh, there's got this big header here, right? Um, and then, of course, it has the filter stuff in here, right? And you notice over here, there's a couple different components. There's the, the GitHub repo list, but there's also this Git, GitHub uh, this virtual repo filter component. So we've got another component. So we've got this component up here, and then we've also got the uh, child components as well. Okay. So there's all of the cards in here. So if we look at the HTML, notice things are a little bit different here. Okay. So first we have an another component. Um, that we're loading here, this Virtua, this uh, repo filter, okay? Um, we have some styles that we're defining here. And what's interesting is that we're using, these are CSS custom properties. So the uh, Virtua GitHub repo list component is exposing some particular properties which can be used inside of it for customi customizing the styling, okay? And that's what these are here. And then what we have here, inside of the, the main list component, we put some other elements inside of it. We put a header um, and then another component to do the filtering, okay? So if we look at the component itself, the main component, okay? So things are a little bit different. Um, first of all, when we look at the styles, um, we actually have an array of styles. So it's very easy to share styles in what element just by having different uh, static variables. So in another file, I have this, which I can share across different components. And I can share it across any components I want, and then I could have as many different you know, sets of styles which I am sharing across different components just by having um, static constants, essentially, okay? And then for the CSS for this component, I have uh, you know, some stuff for sections, but I also have this special slotted thing. And slots basically ha allow you to, to inject content from the parent page. So it's sort of like the, uh, what is it, ng content or whatever in Angular. So you can basically project the children into different slots inside of your existing component, okay? Um, so this is basically saying for that slotted component, it, inside of its header, you apply these styles and also use these variables, okay? Anytime you use a variable, you can pick a default value. So here I'm picking a default of 24 points, but if they, if they uh, specify a value, we'll use that instead, okay? So this stuff is all the same. Um, but there's stuff that's a little bit different here. So I've added an event listener for a topics changed event, okay? Because anytime someone does filtering, I'm listening for an event to, to update my values accordingly, okay? Um, and then inside of my render method, I'm actually, I've actually broken, up, broken it up into three different methods now, or two different methods, okay? So the first one renders the header, okay? Um, and uh, that's what's happened here. You notice inside of the header, there is a slot. So it's injecting the content from the parent, okay? And uh, I broke up the card into another method, okay? And there's also an error message which is displayed. If there's an error, we want to display that instead of having an empty, uh, empty uh, card there, okay? So you can break up, you can compose your render method out of different render methods, okay? Um, the query stuff is pretty much the same. And this is the event listener, 
So there's a topics change listener, which calls this filter method. And what the filter method is going to do is basically listen to this topics changed event um, and then update the uh, topics, I mean, update the query property accordingly. Okay? So basically, whenever you click on change, click on the checkbox, and then it gets fired, the opponent listens for it, updates its value, and then you get a new list of repos. Okay? So that's the main component. And the other ones are fairly straightforward. The card has some styles. But other than that, um, it's pretty much just a whole bunch of HTML, right? So this just displays an individual repo and all the properties about it, okay? And you pass into it a repository object, okay? And we notice we're not using reflect attribute because we don't really want to display the JSON for the entire object in the DOM, right? And then there is the uh, filter component which basically um, just renders, um, basically has a list of topics, right? And then it renders a checkbox for each one. And then when you click on it, it then updates its value here on topic toggle and then fires an event, a normal, just each, a normal DOM custom event, fires that um, using dispatch event, okay? Um, the only other important part of this is that it uses a nice feature um, of a uh, lit called uh, a converter. So a converter just gives you an object which makes it easy for you to convert to and from a string, which is, makes sense if you want to render your value in the DOM, okay? Or if you want someone to be able to set the value in the DOM, okay? So the way this component works, you'll notice um, the repo filter here has topics, and it just has an, a list of different topics that are comma separated, okay? So the converter takes the, that list and then turns it into an array, essentially, okay? So this is the converter. See, it's basically just taking that value, either splitting it into an array or turning it back into a string, okay? And the converter is defined up here. Okay. So, that's pretty much all there is to it. We've got these three different components. They're all working together. Um, the, uh, the filter part doesn't have to be inside here. It could be somewhere else in the page because it's just using events, right? So it could be anywhere as long as it's on the page, and then the uh, repo list would, would listen to it and, and, and change accordingly, okay? And what's cool is that if we look at the DOM here, All right, so here is our DOM, right? And here's that repo filter, okay? So you notice, see that select, selected topics property here, right? So if I click on this, you see it's updating, and that's because I set reflect attribute to true, right? And because we have the converter, it's converting it back into a, a list of strings, or a list of values that are common separated. So you see this is updating here, and then each time it updates, you also see up here the query value changing. So now we do lit element, we should get something back, okay? All right, and then also inside of it, you can see each one's shadow DOM, all right? So there's a filter that has the topics and then input elements, all right? And et cetera, okay? So that, that's basically it. That's the demo, which is good because I have negative one minute left. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so, let me uh, close out. All right, so for resources, um, awesome lit element is one of those awesome lists that has some stuff on it. Um, there's a nice tutorial from Vaden, which makes some web components. Um, anyone here heard of Vaden before? Just curious. All right, so a few of you, cool. Um, so they've got a nice little uh, uh, tutorial. Open Web Components is a good starting point. So if you're not really sure and you want like a, a quick, easy starter, Open Web Components has like roll-up stuff. They have a whole bunch of different 
little starter things and helper utilities. So it's a good place to just start and, and play with this stuff. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Stencil, um, which is different than, than a lit element in the sense that it's more of a compiler, but it also uses web components and it's pretty cool too. So you might want to take a look at that as well. And then of course there's a lit element uh, website uh, as well, uh, which is at polymer.org, projectpolymer.org. All right, so I think that is it. Um, if you have any questions, you can come up after. <laughs> but uh, thanks so much for staying to the end. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.